Great, thanks very much, Gabby, and hi to everybody from a cold, uh, snowy but sunny uh, Leicester. Um, is it possible to see my slides, uh, Gabby? I can't see them. Or do I just click on the slides on the right-hand side? Okay, I think I've got it. I'm just uploading my slides. So what I want to talk to you about briefly is um, open practices in general and the implications um, for education. And these slides are available on SlideShare. So um, <clears throat> I recently did a talk um, at the European Parliament and did an outline of some of the key developments in e-learning since the uh, 80s. And I started by looking at the uh, impact of multimedia resources, uh, the emergence of the internet, of course, uh, the notion of learning objects, which were precursors to open educational resources, learning management systems, and now arguably most institutions have some form of learning management system, the first uh, wave of mobile devices, learning design as an approach to help teachers better create uh, learning interventions, gaming technology, uh, open educational resources um, emerged in around 2001, uh, funded and supported through UNESCO and the Hewlett Foundation. Social and participatory media go hand in hand with OER in terms of enabling more open practices, virtual worlds, e-books and devices, and of course, the recent um, hype is the notion of open, uh, massive open online courses. So I want to argue four things in this brief talk that we're seeing a disaggregation of education as a result of new open practices. <clears throat> and increasingly, students will choose to, or learners, I should say, will choose to pay for components of courses rather than the whole university experience. They may pay for high-quality kite-marked resources, for example. They may pay to have uh, guided learning pathways or some form of support or some form of accreditation. And I'm going to look at each of these in turn and pick out some key aspects. So as I mentioned, the OER movement has been around now for over 10 years. There are now hundreds of high-quality OER repositories worldwide, and increasingly institutions are choosing to have a presence on iTunes U. Indeed, Therese Bird and I have got a meeting this afternoon. We're hoping to launch on YouTube uh, for less than uh, later this month. But um, in, a pro in a number of projects, it was found that despite the fact that there were these high-quality, fantastic resources, evaluation indicated that they weren't being used extensively by either teachers and learners. And so the OPAL project, uh, which I was involved with a few years ago, shifted from looking at the development of OER to looking at the ways in which OER were being used, created, stored, and shared. And it came up with a rich set of practices of OER, which it translated into a set of guidelines for different institutional, different stakeholders of OER. And the stakeholders were identified as learners, teachers or professionals, organizational leaders, and policymakers. And this little visual map shows you the components of the guidelines enabling institutions to look at strategies and policies for OER, for example, starting with a vision for open educational practice, moving through to an implementation uh, plan to promote the use of OER across institutions, right through to things like what kind of skills do teachers need to be able to more effectively use OER, and what sort of support mechanisms are available to um, help this. In a follow-up project, Power Up, which we're currently involved with, <clears throat> we're doing a very detailed uh, set of country reports of what um, OER initiatives are going on. And I won't go in into that in detail, because that's the focus of uh, Ming's talk. But more recently, we can move beyond OER to putting uh, packaging OER together into what have been uh, coined massive open online courses. On the positive side, uh, these are fantastic resources. They're free. UNESCO estimate that over 100 million uh, people don't have, aren't able to access or afford formal education. This provides them with a viable alternative. It enables you to be part of a distributed global community uh, supported through a range of ways in which you can communicate and collaborate uh, with others. And arguably, it enables social inclusion. However, the reality is that there are very, very high dropout rates. Maybe only 5% of people complete. And some people argue that it's about learning income, not learning outcomes, and really that it's just simply a marketing exercise. So the debate on the value of MOOCs is very much out at the moment. There is a special issue at the moment of the e-learning papers journal, which is a call for papers on MOOCs. So I would keep an eye on that, because I think that will give us a very rich insight into some of the recent evaluations of MOOCs. 
Uh, some other publications you might like to look at, <clears throat> particularly those of you who, who um, aren't totally a fay with OER, there's an excellent report, uh, general report um, on open educational uh, resources which came out last year from the Commonwealth of uh, Learning and UNESCO. There's a special issue of distance education uh, on OER and social inclusion, which I was special guest editor for. And there's a very nice report from UNESCO called the 2012 Paris um, OER Declaration. So the second uh, component of disaggregation, I would argue, is the notion of learning pathways. Yes, anything you want to learn is available freely on the internet, but many, many learners would rather have guided pathways which are created by somebody um, that they consider an expert in the area. And these guided pathways can promote different pedagogical approaches. And the pictures on the right-hand side are some different ways in which you can foster collaboration. For example, on the top side, you see the jigsaw puzzle, where you divide a problem into four parts, green, red, blue, and yellow. Those people go off and research their problem. They come together with others who've researched the same uh, problem to share their knowledge, and then they go back to the home team and combine their, their findings. Very effective, uh, time-trusted uh, mechanism for fostering collaboration. The third component is that people may choose to have some form of support, whether that's computer-assisted to give diagnostic and formative feedback, whether it's through peer or tutor support or some kind of community, very much um, the notion behind MOOCs, or through some form of mentoring of buddy, buddy schemes, uh, very often very important in vocational contexts, work-based learning. And the final component is accreditation. Uh, so three examples, the peer-to-peer -peer university approach, uh, the OER University, headed by Wayne McIntosh from New Zealand. This is now an international consortium of institutions worldwide. Learners can choose to learn any way they want, and when they feel ready, they can go to one of the member institutions, whether that's UNISA in South Africa or Athabasca in Canada, and get accreditation. So different learners will want different needs. A 55-year-old um, retired woman learning Spanish is going to be very different from somebody who's, a, let's say, an 18-year-old in India who's wanting to get a qualification and a job in the computer industry. For them, accreditation will be very important. And finally, the notion of badges. And recently, um, in a, a MOOC I was involved with, the OLDS Learning Design MOOC, we adapted the uh, Mozilla badges and put them into a social networking site called Cloudworks. And people could evidence their um, competence in different kind of things and um, acquire badges. Very exciting new initiative, I think. So I want to finish by touching on the issue that I think is at the heart of the lack of uptake of OER. So yes, we have an amazing set of technologies which offer learners a whole plethora of ways in which they can interact, communicate, and collaborate with others. And there are now masses of free resources and tools. Arguably, anything you want to learn is available for free on the internet. But the reality is, these are not being fully exploited. Worse than that, we're hardly scratching the surface. And there's evidence that much of the use of um, existing technologies is just replicating bad pedagogy. Lots of evaluations show, for example, that much of the use of uh, learning management systems is simply as a content repository and nothing else. And if you ask teachers why they're not using technologies more, they state they haven't got time and they lack the necessary digital literacy skills to be able to harness the power of these new technologies. So as a result, in the last 10 years or so, a number of us worldwide, particularly in Europe and Australia, <coughs> have been developing a, a new approach to design, a new learning design methodology. And this is to enable teachers to think more creatively, more explicitly about their designs. We argue it encourages um, reflection and scholarly practice and helps promote sharing and discussing. Um, and as part of this, at Leicester, we've consolidated the work we've been doing in this area over the last few years into a new conceptual framework called the seven C's of learning design. And this starts with the conceptualization, the vision for the design. What are we designing? Why are we designing it? Who is it for? What's the core essence of the design? And then a series of things around activities, things to do with capturing resources, for example, doing an OER uh, audit or finding out which materials we might need to create, mechanisms for uh, communicating, for example, uh, to foster good approaches to communication and collaboration, and things around consider in terms of reflection and assessment. 
And then you can have a set of design views which combine these, such as an overview of the course itself. And finally, it's about putting that into practice, implementing it in a real learning context, evaluating it, and refining it. And for each of these seven Cs, we've developed a very rich set of resources and tools which we've used and evaluated in a range of workshops worldwide. Evaluation is very positive. People say it does enable them to think differently, to think more creatively, to think beyond content to the activities their learners will be engaging with. And there's a link to that uh, toolkit at the bottom of the page. So finally, uh, two recent uh, initiatives in learning design, a very exciting uh, report called the Larnaca La Design Declaration on Learning Design. This is a group of us who've worked with James Yell in Australia to articulate what we mean by learning design as a field. And also a, a project we're involved with at Leicester, an EU-funded project, which is trying to combine the various online learning design tools that are into a new, <coughs> more integrated learning design tool. So to conclude, I think the nature of learning, teaching, and research is fundamentally changing. And we are seeing new business models emerge. The OER university, the notion of badges, for example, are only two examples. And for me, it's really about combining OER and new media. It's about harnessing the power of new media and their associated characteristics. And it's about embracing and adopting new open practices. So I hope you found that interesting. We have a new Masters in Learning Innovation, where we talk more about this starting in the autumn, both face-to-face -face and online. A link to the Learning Design MOOC I mentioned is there. And if you're interested in this, I've got aspects of this in a new book which came out earlier this year. Thank you very much. for. That's great. Thank you very much, Grania. Um, you've raised a lot of interesting points there. And there's been some discussion in the chat box while you were speaking. So I think the group is small enough for us to be able to manage um, speaker um, enabling audio for people who want to speak. So can I suggest that um, anybody who wants to make a comment now um, do so? I'm going to start enabling people's audio. I know um, David wanted to make, well, was making comments in the text box, as was Igor. Would either of you like to start, David and Igor, and just uh, explain what your concerns are with OERs that you were raising here? <laughs> OK, well, that's the nature of these. Um, these webinars, David, um, it was might have been slightly tangential. Grania, I don't know if you've been able to follow the what was happening in the text box, um, but the question that Thomas rose really was about um, why OERs are not being used, um, why people don't seem to know about it, whether it's because there's no real lobby behind them, etc. Um, and that led to Therese saying maybe it's difficult for people to adapt them. Um, David disagreeing, saying people are actually reusing online content, but it's probably not OERs. Um, so Grania, do you want to respond to that strand before I go any further? Hi, uh, thanks, Gabby. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, somebody asked the question, is there any empirical evidence for the lack of uptake of OER? A very good starting point, I think, is Open Learn from the OU, uh, Patrick McAndrew and colleagues. Uh, their final report gives a very indica good indication where they looked at what people were doing with OER or not, and they found they weren't being used extensively. So that's an excellent starting point. Uh, also with Patrick and uh, Yanis Dimitriadis, we wrote a chapter following on from a series of workshops we did. We got people to uh, find relevant OER and then critique them and try and unpack them. And one of the difficulties is that um, the inherent design is not explicit. And so the first stage the person has to do is try to unpack what is that inherent design. And then they have to think about uh, unpacking it and repurposing it for a new context. So actually, there's quite a lot of cognitive difficult steps to overcome, uh, which is probably why people aren't using them which is why um, people find it easier just to reinvent the vi w 
wheel and create their own. And there are a number of other um, reports which um, highlight similar things. And again, if you look at the uh, slide that I had with the link to some of the OER resources, particularly the um, report from uh, the book on from uh, Commonwealth of Learning and UNESCO, there are lots of case studies and empirical study results in there. So I hope that answers this question. And yes, I would agree, um, Dom, that teachers do find find it difficult to translate theory into practice. That's why with our learning design stuff, we start with very simple uh, visual representations which teachers can immediately um, engage with. But underpinning those uh, visual representations are lots and lots of good pedagogy. And it really does, the evaluation we've done really does show that it makes them think more creatively beyond content to activities. Sorry, I just realized I was speaking without the mic on. Sorry about that. Um, thanks, Grania, for dealing with that question. Um, so I was, um, I've was i just enabled a few people's audios, the people who've been active in the, um, in the discussion box about these issues. If any of you wants to grab the mic and um, follow up with voice, you're welcome to do so. So, well, let's um, let's leave it there then, because we can we'll move on to Ming's presentation, which will um, look at the whole area of um, international policies for OERs and for open educational practices. Okay, then I'll continue with the uh, presentation. So my presentation is built on the work from PowerUp, uh, which Grania has mentioned in her slides. So PowerUp is an EU-funded project focusing on uh, developing policies for OER uptake. Uh, so in PowerUp, we have um, partners from the UK, uh, the Netherlands, uh, France, uh, Hungary, Italy, and Canada. So the focus of PowerUp is a couple of points. Uh, we build on previous OER initiatives, such as OPPO and ONET. And we produce country reports and case studies. And we analyze the uh, OER communities behind uh, a lot of OER activities and stimulating the uptake of OER through policy. Uh, the uh, so PowerUp uh, is halfway through, and the project has already produced an inventory of more than 300 uh, OER initiatives, and 11 country reports and 13 mini country reports, each report providing an overview of the education system, uh, the internet provision and policy, the copyright law, as well as the, uh, the major OER initiatives taking place in that particular country. So both the infantry and the uh, country reports are available from the PowerUp Wiki. Um, before the end of the project, um, PowerUp will still produce uh, seven case studies analyzing uh, the uh, communities behind OER activities and three EU-wide policy papers for schools, universities, colleges, and other educational providers. Right, uh, so this presentation is based on the analysis of 11 country reports and the 13 mini country reports uh, produced by PowerUp. So the table on the slide will give you some indications about uh, what countries are covered and included in the study. So the following presentation is structured in the following ways. Uh, based on the analysis of all the country reports, countries are divided into three categories. So those countries with OER policies or strategies, and countries active in OER activities, but uh, there is no national OER-related policies. And those countries engage with uh, a lot of initiatives driving the open education movement, but these activities are not necessarily OER-related. 
So, for example, um, in some countries, uh, the ministries of education had clear OER policies or strategies. For example, the Dutch government uh, um, has pointed out the WikiWise program as the nation's uh, OER policy or strategy. So, the WikiWise has, has produced uh, OERs covering the full spectrum of education and using Creative Commons license. The, open uh, the Open University of the Netherlands, one of the partners working on PowerUp, is closely investigating the results of WikiWise, and they're also closely working with the government to inform policy. And the U.S. has a wide range of OER activities taking place in different sectors. Although there is no national OER-related policy and recommendations to OER are included as part of the uh, educational strategy planning documents, such as the National Education Technology Plan. And in Romania, uh, the country has been very active in OER development. And uh, the uh, OER has been included in both the government policies and educational policies. In South Africa, the OER is being incorporated into the educational policies, such as the open and distance learning policy. And the Mexican report has mentioned some development uh, into the OER strategy and the policies. Well, some countries, um, although there is no national level OER policies, that these countries have been very active, uh, engaged with OER activities. For example, uh, in Australia, uh, there is a variety of OER activities taking place across different sectors. Uh, for example, the Open Government Initiative, the Free of Education Movement, and they also have OER activities for both schools and higher education institutions. And New Zealand is another leader in OER development, and they have significant OER activities taking place in different sectors, including the government sectors, OER activities for schools. And also in higher education, New Zealand is leading the OER university initiative. And in Spain, uh, they have a lot of activities for primary and secondary education, as well as in higher education. It's interesting to know that uh, there is a strong presence of Spanish universities in the OCW consortium. And the Spanish universities are also uh, leading in the MOOCs. While some countries are active with OER activities, focusing on one education sector, for example, in Poland, they have the digital school program, and focusing on producing and releasing educational materials uh, licensed under Creative Commons. And in the UK, it's the higher education institutions in England are actively involved uh, in OER programs. Uh, through the uh, government-funded program, such as JISC HEA OER program and the SCORE. In Canada, uh, they are ac more active in the tertiary level. For example, in British Columbia, uh, there is the, uh, the BC Campus Initiative. Also, there is a funding from the ministry uh, to provide open licensed education resources for post-secondary institutions. And recently, there's an announcement of 40 OER courses to be produced for first-year students in uh, universities. And finally, uh, there are other countries engaged with different kinds of initiatives driving the open education movement in general. But uh, these activities are not necessarily OER activities. For example, in Italy, there is the, uh, the Book in Progress initiative. And similarly, in Greece, there is the uh, Digital School initiative. So both initiatives focusing on producing low cost or free textbooks for students. However, these initiatives are not OER activities because uh, Creative Commons is not adopted. And in France, there's another interesting initiative called Digital Universities. 
the seven thematic digital universities in 2012, and uh, they together produced a massive amount of resources in different formats and for different educational purposes. However, not all the resources are OERs. Some other countries, including Hungary, Denmark, Finland, and Norway, uh, they all have some kind of OER initiatives. However, uh, this, the majority of activities they engage with are either to drive the open access or open publication initiative or to promote sharing and free use of digital resources. They're not necessarily um, OER activities. So finally, uh, just based on the country report, and they, the, uh, the report indicated some challenges and opportunities for taking uh, OER forward. For example, uh, the current economic crisis has resulted in a decrease in investment in education and innovation. And this, ha has, this has made the already challenging situation for promoting OER even more challenging. So some national programs are declined, downsized, or not even started. For example, in UK, there seems to be uh, little OER uh, activities for school sectors, and higher education institutions um, have been largely affected by the, um, by the fact that there is no funding from government for OER since, 2003, as, since 2012. Well, uh, another challenge is the lack of in-depth research into the end users of OER. So as a result of the previous OER activities, a massive amount of OERs have been released into the public repository. However, the uh, research into the end user, and especially examining how the resources are being reused and adapted by the end user, uh, is not sufficient. But there are opportunities as well, for example, the rise of MOOCs, as Gronia has mentioned in her slides, which might offer a new approach and business model for taking OER forward. And finally, in the UK, and after the cessation of uh, government funding for OER, the higher education institutions are joining in Future Learn, which, uh, which is a new initiative aimed at uh, bring together a range of free online courses from UK leading universities. So at the moment, there are 18 members in Future Learn, including the Open University in the UK, uh, the British Library, and 15 other universities. And the University of Leicester has just joined the uh, Future Learn recently. So finally, for further information about PARP, you can go to the website and the wiki. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ming. And apologies to everyone who is having sound issues there. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly now. Um, I'm not sure what the problem was there, but it seems that Adobe Connect puts everybody, all participants, on the highest possible volume for their speaker as the default setting. And that doesn't always work for um, every every microphone. So um, there didn't seem to be any questions coming up in the text box there. <laughs> yeah, you might need to turn up to hear me. Um, if there are any questions for Ming, please write them now, because um, we could take a few minutes for her to answer questions. I would be interested to know whether, while listening to Ming, anybody found any surprises where you were expecting um, a certain kind of report coming from a particular country, and Ming said something different about that country. Um, that would be interesting to discuss. So I'll just wait a moment and see if anything's coming up in the text box. There's a question about Germany there. Ming, I don't know if you're in a position to answer that one.
Germany is very active in the field of OER. So, uh, a lot of conference, and we have participants from uh, Germany. And it seems uh, the OER, uh, the government, uh, well, the Germany is not doing. Thanks, Ming. Um, just looking at the text box there. Have you been looking at existing OA policies as well? Igor, do you mean open access policies? Yes. Ming, can you answer that? OK. So. Yeah, um, I think um, so many countries are engaged with open uh, access policies. So they are very active in terms of promoting the open access of public funded project results, for example. And uh, But we think, uh, when we talk about OER activities, we think open access and open publication is only the beginning stage of OER. So what we are really interested is how people reuse and repurpose and adapt uh, open, uh, open educational resources for their teaching and uh, learning purposes, and rather than just Thanks, Ming. Um, and then there is a question from Paige saying, interested to know if discrepancies between degree of institutional support and government policy is consistent in all countries examined. Um, that's a difficult one, I think. Ming, can you answer that one? <laughs> Right. Um, I think in the country reports, uh, we categorize all the OER initiatives in terms of national initiatives, uh, regional in, uh, initiatives, as well as institutional initiatives. So I think some countries, such as the uh, UK, New Zealand, and Australia, and the US, and possibly other countries, that also have significant support from their institutions as well. Thanks, Ming. Um, Igor is trying to clarify his question. Igor, would it help for you to take the microphone? Do you have a microphone in your headset? Hello. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Hi, Igor. OK, um, we hear you. Then. Can you speak closer to your microphone, please? Ah, OK, thank you. Uh, now, what I meant about looking at uh, open access policies is that there are some open access policies that um, are not only making reference to research outputs, um, articles, or book chapters, but they also make reference to publishing materials um, as open educational resources. This could be components of different courses. Uh, but this might be bypassed or not looked at because they are looked at as open access policies and not necessarily as, as OER related policies, per se. OK, thanks for that clarification, Igor. Your voice came across quite softly in comparison, so I think people might be moving their volume controls up and down. Um, I mean, I could respond to that just to say I've been quite... Um, always quite surprised at the distinction somehow between open access, which seems to refer almost exclusively to research papers and journals, and then the whole concept of OERs, which are more teaching and learning materials created for students on courses. And I've found that um, certainly the institutions that I've worked with in the UK seem to have separate repositories for both of those. and. A completely, they kind of compartmentalize them in different parts of their brain somehow. So um, in the instances where there is a, a joined up policy for both, um, that seems to make a lot of sense to me. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to actually move on. Christine, I'll make a note of your comment um, for later. 
and and Ingrid and what other people are saying here. Um, there will be time for more discussion at the end of all the presentations, um, but I don't want to um, have to take time out from Therese and Bernard's presentations at this stage. So thanks for all your comments there. Um, I'll move on to Therese now. Over to you, Therese. 